inspired me to continue on with the topic that I started earlier this month, but I'm back. If you remember, at the beginning of the month, we had talked about a big problem, and that problem was, was lust. And I told you that I would be back, and I'm keeping to my promise, to talk about, well, what can we do to get, to get ahead of that, to make that less of a problem? And so I was trying to figure out, well, where do, where do you start when you, when you back all this up, right? And remember also when we were talking about lust as well, lust is about I. So the first place we've got to start with is we've got to start all the way back at the beginning. And we've got to go all the way back to the beginning and see if we can't figure out how we can avoid the pitfalls. And I went so far back that some of you are going to be like, wow, I'm sure you're going to be wondering where, where we're headed here. And here's what I decided. We're going all the way back to middle school. You're welcome. Those are good memories, I'm sure, for all of us. Uh, because I don't know about you, but I think it's about middle school for most of us where you start to kind of realize, oh, hey, look at that cute person over there, right? It's kind of the beginnings of, you know, boys and girls aren't so icky anymore, and you're kind of like trying to figure out, well, what does that mean? You're too young, really, okay? I'm just, I'm gonna put this on record. You're too young to really have a relationship, all right? I'm not a parent. Those are your parents. You know, do whatever you think makes sense. But you're, but you're trying to figure out, what, well, what does this mean? Ooh. So think back in your mind just for a moment. Don't think too hard, but, and you don't have to raise your hand, you know. Try to think of that, that special somebody who first, first caught your eye. What, what, was that, what was that like for you? You know, what, what do you remember from them? Do you remember, you know, certain characteristics? And maybe also, maybe you had, some of us have had bad experiences where maybe you thought you liked somebody, but they didn't like you back. And that, oh, that was heartbreaking, especially at any age, but especially at that tender age. Now, fast forward just a little bit. And for the married folks who are hearing my voice, can you remember that first encounter or thereabouts when you met that person that you were going to marry? Now, some... I know stories go back quite a ways back, and maybe you've known each other for a really long time, but I'm sure at some point you kind of had this awareness of like, wow, this person is, is special, right? They're not just some friend or just some random person or however you met them. So can you remember that? Can you recall that moment in your head of like when you, when you met that person and you thought, oh, this might go, go to something. I've heard some of your stories. I know they exist. Oh, I'm seeing some smiles, seeing some laughter at some point. Now... A friend of mine, my sister was reminding me of this story while we were on vacation. A friend of mine had a very clear story of a moment where it just sparked and they just knew. Now, everybody's story is a little different. So our friend, this was um, in college. She ended up meeting her husband at a uh, frisbee, football frisbee something. I don't remember what we were playing. Anyways, and my sister remembers this really clearly for a couple different reasons. One, she's more observant than I am. I don't know if some of you are the people like me who, like, I never knew in high school who liked you unless it was obvious. I would have to be told, oh, by the time I was told that Sally and John were dating, they'd already broken up. By the time I figured that out. I'm not that person. But my sister's really good at this. So my sister was, she was in the know right away. And she was, we were actually both there the first day that these, they met. And for some reason, as they're out playing frisbee, football, or whatever, just, they just gelled. And once he came off the field, she was on the sideline for a little bit, came off the field, and they started talking to each other, started to get to know each other. And my sister remembered very much, she goes, you know, our friend has liked other people, but there's, there's something about this particular guy that she just really connected with. And she said, I knew that that was the case when we got home later. And she started, <laughs> true story, starts going, well, where's my wedding magazines? And my sister was like, well, this is a little early. We've just met this man. She was flipping through, taking a look. She didn't say, this is who I'm going to marry. She just, that was probably in her brain, but she just pulled these out. She's looking through some ideas. Now, fast forward a week or two later, for whatever reason, we, we knew this guy a little bit too as well. My sister, I wasn't there on this one, for whatever reason was taking him back to wherever he lived at that time from another game. And he tells her in the car, in case she wasn't already sure that they liked each other, he says, you know, your friend is really special to me. I really like your friend. And she goes, I don't know if he's telling me that because, you know, those of you know, you got to get in with the friends if you're going to get with the, especially with the girl. you got to get in with the girlfriends if you're going to 
you're going to get to know her. If the girlfriends don't like you, you're kind of in trouble. That's just a little, that's a little further ahead. But I don't, we don't know if that's why you're saying that, but he, he made sure to let her know, the friend, I really do like your friend, and I have very honorable intentions. Okay. Well, fast forward, of course, they have since gotten married and have children. But their story represents what I'm talking about, where sometimes there's just that that spark at the beginning. Now, everybody has, has a story of this in some way or another. And so we're going all the way back to the beginning to say, what do you do? And think about this, for those of you who are married, you don't need this piece, but you have people in your life, kids, grandkids, people around you, that are at the beginning stages of going, well, what do I do when I like somebody? If you haven't given people advice like this, you might be a little bit more like me, who's like, people don't ask you because you don't know these things, you don't recognize these things. Or you might be forced, like myself, you're in a job where you gotta learn these things to be able to give, give actually reasonable advice. Although I will say a lot of this is common sense. So if this doesn't directly relate to you, think about the people in your life that need to know this. What do you do at the beginning? What do you do at the beginning? So here's a couple of tips that I'm gonna, gonna give you here. And I'm keeping it simple for a variety of reasons. One, as you guys know, I've just came back from a long trip. And two, I don't think it needs to be that complicated. It doesn't need to be that complicated. And I owe a large debt, by the way, to a video I saw um, from Project Impact Mission that shared these tips and I've just expanded on them. So I wanna acknowledge that as well. And they gave this idea of what do you do at the beginning, especially as a Christian, when you see somebody and you go, hmm, I'm kinda interested in them, what do we do? And so here's the three tips we're gonna, we're gonna go to the Bible as well. But one is to discern re idea versus reality. Two, is to look for overlapping paths, and three, is to grow in love. So let's look at this first idea, discern I an idea versus reality. I'm also pretty sure that you guys have all been there, either yourself or seen somebody else do this, where somebody catches your eye, and you think, wow, they're so amazing, they're so whatever, and at some point you have a little bit of a reality check to realize this person isn't what you thought they were. I'm sure we've all had that. You don't even have to have that in terms of a romantic relationship. You can have that in just knowing people. I'll give you an example that's not related to romantic relationships. I remember, this was also middle school, I remember I was either fifth or sixth grade um, and I went to a multi-grade school, um, K through eighth, and one of the older girls, I'm gonna say she was probably an eighth grader, and I really looked up to her. I was like, oh, she's really sporty, she's really, she was very nice to the younger kids, which was a, a bonus for those of you who ever, <laughs> ever been picked on by the older kids. It's a bonus when the older kids are nice to you, especially at that age. Um, and so she was very nice and very friendly, and I just kind of had her a little bit on this pedestal, and I remember this one day in particular, I don't remember what we were playing, but we were out at recess, and she said something that I, in my brain, because I had her on this pedestal, it wasn't a cuss word or anything like that, but she was talking about something that was a little bit more coarse, and I immediately was like, oh, I did not think you were this kind of person. And it kind of shattered that respect that I had for her a little bit, even as a fifth, sixth grader of like, oh, this is not who I thought it was. And I wasn't close to her, I wasn't like a good friend of hers. But it illustrates what I'm trying to get to. You've all been there where you've thought somebody was a certain way and they do something, say something, or you hear something and you go, mm, that's not what I, what I thought. And so we're gonna go to the Bible here. You guys saw this story previously. Poor Samson, as I said, is almost a poster child of things that could go wrong, but we're only gonna hit a certain piece of his story to illustrate this. This is Judges 16, four to six. It says, some time later, he fell in love with a woman in the Valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. We all know how this story ends. We're at the very beginning, but let's look at what the Bible tells us right here. Who is it that fell in love? He, Samson, is who is pointed out here, which should tell us something at the beginning. Samson was the one initially that thought, oh, this, this lady looks real nice, whatever, you know, I'm real interested in her. We do not see anywhere in the story where it says that she even really reciprocates this. 
She probably liked him well enough from what we could tell. But it's not too long into this, the Philistine rulers realize they have an opportunity here, and they ask her, hey, you know, this guy has been, I'm paraphrasing, right? This guy's been causing so much havoc. Can you just figure out how we can take him down? We'll pay you to do it. It doesn't tell us her answer, but we can know what her answer is because immediately behind that it says, so she went to him and asked the exact question they asked her for. See, Samson fell in love with an idea. I'm sure, like most of us, most of us are not like, oh, I like so-and-so, I see this person, and because they're so terrible, this is why I like them. That is not usually how this starts. You do not start out being like, I think this person's terrible, and therefore I like them. That's not typical, and that's not normal. <laughs> but it is normal for us to be a little bit blindsided, a little bit like, oh, I'm not going to notice that, that they're doing this or that. I don't uh, try to just keep in here, or to ignore some of the early signs of, like, this isn't going to go well. You would think, in Samson's case, as time goes on, right, he, he initially, it says he loved her, so that means in some way he must have felt safe. He must have thought he could trust her. That, those are the things that are givens when you use that word. Eventually, though, you would think he would catch on as she's asking him repeatedly, so how, do, how does your strength work here? How can we get rid of that? How can you become weak? How can we, you know, subdue you and tie you up? And he gives her false leads, but she keeps coming back to it. He's blinded, and she keeps coming back to ask the same question. That should be, as some of us use these terms, that should be a red flag. She keeps coming back to the same question. Why do you keep asking me this? Yeah, she, she's wearing him down. But here's the thing to think about at the very beginnings. Don't be like Samson, all right? Just because we love somebody doesn't mean they're good for us. Oh, that hurts, especially when you're younger. Because we, we, that's why we call this like to be like. We like to be liked when we, you know, when we love somebody or whatever word you want to use. We want it. Oh, you know, they're going to be so good for me. No, just because you feel a certain way does not mean that person is going to be good for you or that that person is for you. Sorry to spoil any illusions people have. You can have that feeling and never do anything with it. But the question to ask ourselves, and I would encourage you, not even just yourselves, if you are talking to somebody who's bringing this up, to ask them, do, do we love the idea of who the person is instead of who they actually are? And if you are somebody who can give feedback and say, hey, I'm noticing some problems here, like he, she is constantly asking you this question about your strength, Samson, like maybe we should think about this. Why does she keep asking you that? Like you keep giving her answers, but she's not, ta she's taking them, but something's not right here or whatever it may be. Or I'm noticing, hey, you know, this person kind of runs with a rough crowd, you know, maybe they're not, or maybe you've seen or interacted with them and you're like, yeah, they're not really nice to, hey, somebody's not really nice to their parents. That's a problem as well. Who are they interacting with? They might have difficult family situations, but we all know that you can still be respectful even if your parents aren't the easiest to, to get along with. So thinking about how do we early on discern that one of the things is to go ask somebody. Ask somebody that you know. Ask friends, family members. What do you see before you decide to pursue any further? Make sure it's somebody you trust that they can give you some feedback on what do they see in this, in you, in them. Are you idealizing? We, we've all done this. Like I said, we've all done this in some, some way. It's normal to do that, but you really just want to early on kind of tease out, am I able to see clearly? And the other thing that I would suggest too is give some time. Give some time. There's a reason why when you're getting to know somebody, there's that getting to know somebody, period. You can't know somebody right right away. You've got to spend some time. You've got to see them in different settings, and et cetera. And I know a lot of people don't like to do that. We don't like to take the time. We're interested in them. Hey, we were talking about the idea of lust. It's about me, 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 right? How many dates in did we say? Three dates in, people are already like, let's go sleep together or whatever. That's not time. That's not time to get to know and see, this is the person I really want to spend, spend some time with. So slow it down and get a chance to see what they are like in all the different settings. So our next tip was looking for overlapping paths. And we were talking about this um, earlier, and I thought that was funny. I'm like, oh, we're just going to talk about this. So this is the idea of looking at where you're headed, where this other person's headed. So let's say that you're able to kind of discern, like, yeah, I still kind of like them. I, I can accept that they have flaws. There are things that I can work with, though. 
I'm not necessarily idealizing them. Now we want to look at, well, where, where is this person going? And my thing is coming off my ear here. So Amos 3, 1 to 3 gives us this. Hear this word, people of Israel, the word the Lord has spoken against you. Against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so. This last part is the important piece. Now remember, Amos is one of the minor prophets. He's bringing to the Israelites attention, you are on a not so good path. Those of you who remember our Deuteronomy study, God talks about the blessings and cursings. And they're right in the smack in the middle of these cursings, right? They have lived sexually immoral lives. They're victimizing people. They are rejecting God. And God's saying, I have another path for you over here. Look at this. It's a path of trust and obedience and safety and care and all these different things. And so he says, can two walk together unless they agree what path they're on? He's like, you're on a totally different path. So I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I was thinking back to a time when I was in college um, where I knew very clearly there was two different, two different paths. And I remember this, um, this guy had invited me out on a date um, from one of the classes I was in. And when he came to pick, pick me up that evening, we were just going over to a friend's house to do whatever. And I was listening to the music in his, his car. He had it turned on. And I laugh now because now I kind of like the, some of the music he was playing. But at the time, I was like, and it wasn't anything crazy. Don't, don't get me wrong. At the time, I was like, oh, I don't know about this guy's taste in music. That's not a deal breaker. I'm not saying that is, OK? But I do remember that initially, I was like, OK, we're ready. I could tell just by what we were listening to. We're already not on the same, same page. It was fine. No big deal. So we get over to the friend's house. I don't remember much of what we did that evening. I do remember at some point during the evening that he starts to talk to me a little bit about his plans for the future. It wasn't anything big. It wasn't like, um, you know, I'm going to get married and da-da-da-da. He was just kind of like talking about like what he was doing with college, how he could see himself staying in Walla Walla. His family was from there. That was really important to him. At the time, as he was saying that, and even now, I think, it was really smart of him to kind of get out ahead of things. Here's, here's what I'm looking for. And he was obviously dating with some intention. And he had said to me, too, he's like, I'm just trying to figure out who I might fit with. So it wasn't really a serious date, and I knew that. But when he said, I think I'm going to, I want to stay here in Walla Walla. This is, where, this is where my roots are. I knew myself well enough at the time that I was like, I am not staying in Walla Walla. So already, just that particular piece of the path, I knew okay, that doesn't mean God cannot figure things out for you, for, okay, and change your mind. But I knew right then from hearing him say, this is what I see for my future, I couldn't even see myself on that track with him if I had wanted to. He was nice enough. And I could see we were going to be headed down different paths. Now, needless to say, we didn't have any other dates after that. We mutually agreed, like, eh, you're nice enough, but this is, this is not for me, obviously. Um, and it was fine, but it just made me think about that idea of like recognizing when you're getting to know somebody, where are they headed? Do you see yourself going down that path? This is especially important for those of us who are Christians and Seventh-day Adventist Christians to be looking at. If you're interested in somebody, first of all, if you're a Christian and they're not a Christian, you're already just automatically on two different paths, just automatically. And even if you are a Christian, that doesn't guarantee that you're in the right on the right path either. And the path doesn't even have to be, like it just said, there's nothing dramatic about him wanting to stay there in Walla Walla. I just kind of knew that was not for me, too hot. And I wanted to do other things based off what he was saying. And we didn't have much else in common, so it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to go anywhere. But even as Christians, and particularly as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we all know this one as well, just because you're a Christian does not mean that you're going to fit with somebody else. I think in some ways, I'll be a little bold here, those who are Sunday keepers, you've got, a, you've got a little more to work with. You can at least agree on Sunday. If you're a Sabbath keeper, we've seen this, we've heard this, if that other person is not, and that's not important, that's a different path. That's already a different path. Um, but there's all kinds of reasons why there might be different paths. So things to consider here, right? Are they going down a path that you even want to go down? Right? If you're recognizing and seeing somebody's trajectory and you're seeing they're doing things, that you don't like, or they're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to Timbuktu, and you're like, I'm never going to probably move to Timbuktu. Like, 
look at where they're going. Do you want to go with them? But also, just as importantly, is to look at what do you what are you doing? Where are you going? And is this person going to encourage you in this? This does not mean that you have to be doing the exact same things and you're like doing everything together. Those of you who are married probably know this to be true. You are not doing everything, I think, 100% together. I've seen you separated at one point, so I know you're not doing everything 100% together. But there are certain things that you agree on that keep you going in a, in a general direction together. And so we want to be thinking about if I'm wanting to do a certain thing and will that other person encourage me in that, particularly as a Christian, are they going to encourage my Christian walk? Can I encourage their Christian walk? And are we in kind of in agreement on the basics of this, of where we're going? I think we too often just want to kind of gloss over that, especially the younger we are, because it's hard to tell when you're younger, where am I going to go, where am I going to end up? Some of us may be a little clearer than others. I know I wasn't. I mean, I was somewhat clear, obviously, in college about I wasn't going to be living in Walla Walla, but that didn't, I didn't know at that time where that meant I was going to be. But I did know that I had some ideas of this is kind of how this is going to lay out. And so it's hard to know, but we all can see a little bit ahead and kind of get a feel for, like, do, do I want to go with this person? Will they come along with me? And you can tell that, too, by the interactions that you have with that person. You don't have to have all things in common, but it does help to be headed in the same direction. So our last one, you might look at that and be like, wait a minute, I thought we were talking about, like, this is before maybe we've fallen in love with somebody. Grow in love. Okay, this is not, like, you see this person, and, and this is what I'm saying. I'm not saying, you see this person, and then you're going to marry them, and you're going to grow in love, yada, yada. This is talking about the biblical form of love. Using an opportunity to get to know somebody and to represent God well and to practice, really. And this is, comes from Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. I mean, this goes right back to that countercultural way of what we were talking about a couple weeks ago. The idea of lust and putting ourselves first. If you're looking at that other person and all you can think about is what the other person can, can do for me, like I said a little bit a moment ago, you want to be looking at like how they can be helpful. Are they going to help you or are they going to hinder you on your path? But there should be also the ability to look at, am I the right person for them? Not just do I think they're the right person for me? What can they give to me? This is an opportunity to practice and see well, how can I love others well? As a general rule, how do I interact with this person in a way that is God-given, right? Even if we never end up together. Because here's the thing. God can use who you love to teach you something even if you don't end up together with that person. I know this has been true in the uh, friendships and relationships that I have been in. Some friendships don't last a long time. Some for, last for a longer season. And each one of those times, I have learned things about myself I've learned things as I'm interacting with other people about how to interact with other people, how I interact with other people. Sometimes I learn stuff that I'm like, oh, I did this so well. And other times I learn stuff like, oh, that did not go well. I don't want to repeat that. You want to do something a little different. So it's an opportunity for us to grow in our love for people like God loves us. And as we're wrapping this up, I want us to remember all these different things why is this even important? Why are we even having conversation about what happens at the very beginning stages? Relationships are really important. The most important relationship should be with God and a reminder to us wherever we're at, God loves us. And this is 1 John 4.19. We love because he first loved us. God loves us regardless of where we're at. Whatever relationship status we have or don't have, he loves us regardless and gives us the ability to love those around us in whatever relationships they may be. They may be romantic relationships. They may just be your friendships. They may be your family relationships. They may be the people that you're working around. You have an opportunity to share that love that God has given you with the people around you and to practice and grow in love. And when you can do that, when you can have healthy relationships in general, your romantic relationships are going to be better. If you can have just the general skills to know how to love others well, it's going to help you. And I'm sure those of you who have been married know this. If you can have a friendship base, you've got a good start. 
you've got a good start. You don't wake up every morning. This is my understanding. You don't wake up every morning and be like, I'm so totally in love with this other person. I'm, I've heard this from other people. I don't know this from personal experience. But I'm guessing that you do wake up and most mornings you still like the person that you're with. And there are moments when you're like, hopefully more often than not, when you're like, oh, I really love this person. But even on those hard days, you don't go, well, I don't feel it, so I'm giving up. No, right? You made a commitment and you're like, okay, I'm going to love this person. And if you're a Christian, I'm going to love this person the way that God has intended me to love this person. So what can we learn? Let's put this all together. The very beginning stages, here's what we learn. Number one, don't be misled by your feelings. Feelings come and go. I don't know about you guys. I don't feel one particular way all the time. Even five minutes apart, I might feel something different. And you can feel mixed things, right? We can feel two things at once. So don't be misled by feelings. That's, that's the key, key thing. Ask for advice. Ask for help. Ask for feedback. Two, when you're looking, if you're looking for a relationship, consider if this relationship is helpful or hindering. This is about that path. Are they going to help me on that path or are they going to hinder me in where I'm headed? And then three, by putting others first, we learn what love is. So practicing putting others first, we really get to know the God-given love. And God is about putting others first, putting others ahead of himself. He came and died because he loved us to save us. And he gives us the same opportunity to learn to not only love others well, but gives us the ability to look around and to be able to teach others the same thing and represent him well in all our relationships.